Welcome back. So, um, so far in this class, uh, so far we've been deal to dealing with some uh, um, some uh, made up examples, like infinite square well, it's uh, one of those made up examples. And um, that's uh, where we are kind of limited to because the, we live in three dimensional world. If you're gonna deal with the real things, it's going to be three dimensional. And as you will see in some glimpse of the math that's required for the working out the hydrogen atom, the calculus for that becomes very difficult very quickly. So, um, so this is sort of the end of where we are actually working out the differential equations. And now I'm just gonna point to the result <laughs> that's been derived. And it's going to actually overlap quite a bit with something you might have seen in your chemistry class. So, um, so reminder of a hydrogen atom. So you know what hydrogen atom is. It's a proton with electron orbiting around it. And that's how we handled it so far. In fact, the Bohr's semi-classical model, that's how we did it. You know, proton here, electron, we think of it as a circular orbit around the proton. And um, at some point, you impose the quantum mechanical assumption that angular momentum is quantized for whatever reason. So that's a semi-classical analysis because your starting point was that it's somehow a particle moving in an orbit. That's a classical statement to make. You don't say that in quantum mechanics. Um, so for a fully quantum mechanical treatment, your starting place has to be the Schrodinger equation. This really has to be your uh, starting place. And um, so far, we have been dealing with the Schrodinger equation in 1D, one dimensional. Uh, you can kind of notice that from the variable x. <laughs> um, I haven't so far mentioned the y or z. And um, with the hydrogen atom, it's a three-dimensional object. So proton at a point, let's say it's at rest, it doesn't move, but electron is going to be moving around all over the place. And you need to have a three-dimensional wave function that describes the electron. So, um, so what that means is, um, so solving for the hydrogen atom means finding a wave function for the electron in three dimensions. And when you just uh, look at this, you might look at it and think, oh, that looks fairly reasonable. It doesn't look at all complicated. And that's because I have um, um, taken advantage of notations that make things look simpler. The biggest thing I have done is I have made use of these vector notations. So whenever you see vector, that's your cue to be aware of, like check yourself. Make sure, do I understand what the notation means? Because what each of these means is that that function that's written there, seemingly as a function of one parameter, is actually a function of three parameters, x, y, z. So before you do any, or you know, this is a Cartesian coordinate, or you know, if you use a polar coordinate, then it will be r theta phi. By the way, be careful with the polar coordinates. Uh, the convention for mathematicians and convention for physicists is exactly the reverse, how we use theta and phi. For us, uh, theta is the azimuthal angle, angle from z, and phi is the uh, whatever the x, y thing is. Uh, mathematicians do it the other way. We are doing it the correct way. Um, and uh, same thing for V. Uh, so V, in general, is going to be a function of x, y, z. Now, it turns out an arbitrary function like that is very difficult to deal with. And um, that's really the reason you would ever be using spherical coordinates is because you are dealing with what's called a central, uh, central force, central potential. Well, whatever is where the potential is a function of R only, no angular dependence. And this actually describes a lot of things. Gravity is like that, um, electricity is like that. So it actually describes a lot of things. But so that's what I, all this complexity is what I am hiding behind this uh, seemingly uh, simplified notation is equal to E psi x, y, z. 
And really the biggest uh, offender here, well, not offender, biggest simplification I have gained <laughs> is this Laplacian. I was talking about it a little bit before class. It, it, this is a wonderful notation that actually accomplishes two things. When I write my equation this way, one, I'm writing it in a way that's a coordinate independent. So this is the correct equation, whether I choose Cartesian or polar uh, spherical coordinate. So it, this is like a good general equation to remember. And um, that's one. And the second thing is um, it reduces all this number of letters I need to write down. So let me just expand this out, because this is hiding just so much that it's uh, easy to forget how complicated of a mathematical object Laplacian is. Um, so do I want to? I, yeah, I don't think I have, do I have? I think I have space to write it out here. So let me do a version here. So this is what that Laplacian means when you write it all out. When you write it all out, well, let me do it first step. Uh, what Laplacian represents, it actually represents an inner product. It represents uh, that product of gradient to itself. Do you guys remember what gradient was in that 3C? Yes, kind of. Uh, I'll just write it out. I won't ask you. So I, I, I remember gradients well in the Cartesian coordinates. So I'll do that in Cartesian coordinates first. Um, so gradient is the x hat partial derivative with respect to x plus y hat partial derivative with respect to y plus z hat partial derivative with respect to z. That dotted to itself. x hat partial, oops, x. y hat partial plus z hat partial. When you take the dot product, it actually becomes a little bit simpler because only x hat dot x hat is not 0, it's 1. So I get double x derivative, double uh, partial derivative with respect to x, plus double partial derivative with respect to y, plus double partial derivative with respect to z. So this is what Laplacian is. So this is actually simple enough for me to write down here in the expanded version of this expression. All right, so that, just write it out here. So these are all operators, by the way. So um, I have factored it out to the left so that I don't have to write down as much. But um, for you to do anything useful, you kind of have to remember to apply this to the function that it's acting on. Um, and I still have these coefficients, so let me finish writing them now. Minus h bar squared over 2n. So this is one version of Schrodinger equation in 3D. And, um, and you know, this is actually doable. If uh, we had like an extra day, you could actually do this with a three-dimensional infinite square well. It's actually doable. Um, now the problem is you are not dealing with the infinite square well. You are dealing with um, electrostatic potential, meaning uh, I think if I scroll down, I'll see electrostatic potential here. Ah, meaning we are dealing with this potential here, right? So all right, fine. So let me rewrite this potential in terms of that um, minus minus k e squared over r, uh, but that's, uh, that's wrong. Because I'm writing this equation in terms of parameters x, y, z, Cartesian coordinate. I cannot just suddenly uh, put in polar, uh, spherical coordinate variable. So I have to rewrite r in terms of my Cartesian variables, meaning this is square root of x squared plus y squared plus g squared. So staring at this, I don't get great confidence that I'm going to be able to do this. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to. I just wanted to show you that it is a very complicated uh, equation that takes a lot of mathematical tools to be able to do it. And really, the um, way to do it is by using the polar representation, where the potential is written more simply, minus k is squared over r. But when you do that, there's a trade-off. 
your Laplacian becomes super complicated in polar coordinate, the spherical coordinates. I don't even remember that. I, I always look it up. I never write it down. <laughs> so so um, this is all to explain that we are not going to do this exactly. <laughs> so I'm going to just quote the result that comes out of it. 